have had a lot of pretty amazing experiences living here in Montana. So one of my favorite experiences living here was um, a few years ago when my boys were little and we decided to go camping on uh, the Gallatin River and down near Yellowstone, but not in the Yellowstone Park. And it was one of our first experiences out there years ago when the boys, like I said, when the boys were little. And um, we were the only ones in a tent on in this campsite, everything else, everyone else was in RVs. And we're sitting around our campfire. My husband had caught a couple fish and we had eaten them for dinner. And I saw something moving around in the bushes, not 15 feet away from the campfire where we were sitting. And I said, wow, there's something in the bushes. And my husband said, yeah, maybe a raccoon or something. And I thought, well, that would be a mighty big raccoon because I'm seeing these bushes really moving. And all of a sudden this head pops out of the bushes and it's an adolescent grizz, it's an adolescent grizzly bear. And um, I, as we had, now I'm a city girl. I grew up in Colorado Springs and LA and Denver and Washington DC. And I had remembered seeing all this information about when you see a bear, they don't like flashes. They don't like bright lights. So if you have a flashlight, turn it on. I happen to have a camera in my backpack. So I said to my husband, oh my gosh, should I grab the camera? And of course he thinks I mean to take a picture. <laughs> I, I looked at him and he, he said, no, get the babies and get in the car. <laughs> and, uh, so I didn't argue with him because you don't argue with the man that thinks that you want to take a picture of a bear in your campsite. <laughs> so I just got the babies he got in the car. <laughs> Meanwhile, he took a giant flashlight and, and pointed it at the bear and was able to kind of scare it and walk it out of the campground, which was great. Uh, but that was our first experience with a bear when we moved here. And you immediately referred to your husband as your hero. Um, sure. <laughs> sure, that's what I did. <laughs> hey, folks, just real quick, um, I'm going to be monitoring the, the chat area. If you have questions for Sarah, we're going to talk in some detail about uh, a variety of topics, uh, storytelling and such. But for now, if you would chat in uh, where you are watching from, where are you? What city are you in? So I'll keep an eye on the chat box. And Teddy, take it away. Cool, cool. So Sarah, uh, I invited you to this uh, after talking about stories don't define you, how you tell them will, because this is important, really important for people in job search, because we all have these stories about ourselves, about our experiences, about the jobs we've had, the roles we've had, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes we fumble telling those stories. And uh, so could, could you speak to that a little bit in the context of maybe how uh, the, some thoughts you should have about telling your stories in an interview? Oh, sure. There's, there's actually a, a whole chapter in my book about career and professional storytelling, and particularly about when you're being interviewed, whether that's for a job or for media interviews. Um, it's one of the points of my book is that you create your story portfolio. So there are worksheets at the back of the book to help you uncover the appropriate stories for certain audiences and circumstances. So it's really helpful to have kind of a handful of stories at your disposal that you've practiced or that you at least have some sense of what the intention is when you tell it. So for instance, when you're being interviewed, one of the things that frustrated me most about interviewing people when I was doing that for public sector agencies and um, federal, state, and local government agencies was that I would ask a question and sometimes they would answer it, sometimes they wouldn't. They would sometimes start to tell a story, but then it wasn't actually relevant to the question that I had asked. So it's really important to, first of all, listen carefully and be really observant of the people that you're trying to share a story with. Um, I'm asked a lot, what's the biggest mistake people make in storytelling? And they think I'm going to say, well, they go on too long or they give up too much detail or something like that. But really the biggest mistake is not observing your audience as you're speaking. Mm -hmm. So um, sharing a story for an interview, it's really important that you think ahead and you do your research on that position description and basically pick 
two stories that really demonstrate your strengths in that area. So for instance, um, if you're applying for anything related to customer service, I promise you will be asked, tell me about a difficult customer and how you handled it. Every, every position that relates to customer facing positions, they're gonna ask you that question or some version of it. So have a story ready that you can describe. For instance, um, I worked at the circulation desk at a local library for a while and a woman came in really, really angry. It was 10 minutes till closing time and I was alone at the desk. And she was so angry. She was sure that she had turned in a book and then she showed me this letter that said that it hadn't been turned in and she's just furious. And I stayed very calm the whole time. And by the end of the conversation, she had decided and was actually very insulting. She said, you people don't know what you're doing. You never mark things when things are turned in. I'm gonna make you sign a letter the next time I turn something in that shows that I turned it in. So I said, oh, that's a really interesting idea. Let's, let's make sure that you know, we bring this forward for a possible solution to this in the future. And um, as she was leaving, I said, would you do me a favor and just make sure you check under the seat of your car? Because sometimes those covers are really slippery and they slide right under the seat. So just check there one more time for me. And she stomped out of there. She was furious that I would even suggest it. And she came back the next day and I happened to be there at that shift. She walked in the door and literally tossed the book onto the counter and it slid all the way over to me and I just barely caught it before it hit the ground. And I said, oh, you found it. Where was it? She said, under the seat of my car. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will never forget that because I felt like I was very calm and I knew that if I hadn't responded the way that I did, that it would have escalated. She would have been more angry. And um, so when I needed to tell that story, I could tell that story. Yeah. So I, I get it. I, um, the stories that you tell have to show your value in an interview. Uh, or a conversation with a hiring manager, the stories have to show your value and they have to be to some degree or another, you have to make sure that you're telling it in such a way that they want to hear it. Oh, absolutely. So, so you said, um, you said one of the ways to do that is to have your portfolio of stories and then practice them. How do you practice telling a story? Well, think about um, some of your favorite audiences and um, some of your favorite performers and storytellers. One of the best things you can do when you're trying to practice for these kinds of things is observe other people. So whether you're watching YouTube or doing it in person, watch what you really like about it and what you don't like about it. Really um, watch very carefully at facial expressions and hand movements. Are they moving too much? Are they playing with their hair too much? Um, do you love it when they include humor? And what is the humor? What kind of humor is it? Um, and so observe other people and then practice in front of a mirror, practice in front of your dog, uh, find a good friend or a family member that would be willing to listen to your story. And when you're starting to tell the story, think very hard about what you want the person to think when you finish. Mm. What, is, what is the action you want them to take or what do you want them to think about you when you finish telling the story? So if you know that for this position, they need to know you're a team player or that you're patient or that you are thoughtful in how you approach a situation, make sure you're telling a story that demonstrates those themes. Yeah, got it. And by the way, Randy and me, to some degree or another, don't have problems with fiddling with our hair anymore. <laughs> just, just saying about it. <laughs> well, speaking, you asked me about uh, my vocal performance. I actually went to a concert a few years ago in Butte, Montana. Um, they have the Montana Folk Festival there. Mm -hmm. And I was watching this woman sing, and she had such a great voice and, and a very good presence on stage but I kept seeing her put her hand through her hair and she kept doing this through her hair and pulling the hair to the side. And as she was singing and it was so distracting and that's why I mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. So now I got the musician part. Wait, wait, wait. you went to Butte, but you didn't say that you played. Not at that concert, but I have played in Butte 
quite a lot. We, my band has played at the Silver Dollar Saloon in Butte, um, where our claim to fame is to play on um, St. Patty's Day at the Silver Dollar Saloon in Butte. And of course we missed it this year, but we played for five years in a row and it was really fun. Randy, Road Trip 2021. Yeah, well, do you sing? Do you play instruments? Yes. What, what's, your, what's your role? I sing. Um, and as a matter of fact, I just recorded the audio book of Your Stories Don't Define You. And my sound engineer is working through it now. And we're going to be recording two songs to include as bonus tracks when people buy the audio book. Good deal. Cool. Um, so, um, Sarah, when I'm, uh, when I'm having a conversation with someone you know, and, uh, and it, it, by the way, this is not, by the way, I got to do this as myself in business. I, 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 am looking for a new job every single day, every day looking for a new job as I'm prospecting to grow my multi-million dollar business in my mind. And so how do you, how do you incorporate talking about your skills, your experiences and your accomplishments into the story so that it is becomes vivid? Is that, what, is that fair yeah, to compelling. That I think compelling. Okay. You, you want to create the image in somebody's mind so they feel like they're sitting right next to you or experiencing the story as you're telling it. And again, observe other storytellers. That I, when I started my public speaking, that's the first thing I did was I started, I started being much more intentional about watching what other storytellers and, and performers were doing. What did I like? What didn't I like? What did I find compelling? Um, and there's a, one of the best parts of my activities on LinkedIn way back when I was looking for jobs was getting in touch with Lou Adler. And I mentioned him in my book. He talks about the most important interview question. And he says that the most important interview question is to ask about a major accomplishment. And so whatever you can do to think about which accomplishments will matter for that particular interview or conversation, then again, do this ahead of time. You know, think about, and, and sometimes this is hard. If you're in a low place and your heart is broken and you're feeling like you can't do anything right, those are the hardest times to figure out what your accomplishments are. There are also the most important times to find them. And what I find really valuable is to ask a friend, ask people, what is the magic that I bring? What is something that I do that's unique that you find great value in? And then ask for a story about it. Well, can you tell me about a time I did that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that seems to work really well when I work with my coaching clients. Um, particularly coaching clients who are wanting to improve their public speaking or who want to um, improve their leadership when it comes to connecting more effectively and vulnerably with their, with the people, stakeholders around them. We always start with that. What are your major accomplishments and how do you want to be known? If you want to be known as generous, then you need to find some stories that you can share about your generosity without it sounding like bragging. Yeah. I, um, I was interviewing, or I working with some clients this morning in the insurance industry. And, um, and I'm asking one of the, the, the stakeholders, you know, he had a quote on there. Uh, I can't remember the quote, you know, it was, but it was a very good quote. I can't remember exactly the quote. And he had it in his head, in his LinkedIn profile. And I said, why did you put that on there? He goes, well, read it, man. It's, it's impactful. I like, know there's more to it than that. I said, why do you think that quote is the one that you should lead with on your LinkedIn profile? And then he told me the story about that quote, what it means to him. I said, great, Does, don't just share the quote, share why the quote is meaningful to you and your business. Um, often what I see is we put little nuggets out there and we don't wrap around the context. And it's the context and the story that makes it more impactful. So absolutely. Same thing about our skills and our experiences. It's one thing to say, I am the best peanut butter jelly maker, sandwich maker in the world. Well, why? And what's the story behind that? <laughs> and there isn't one, Randy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, there is. The why, and it's also <laughs> what's in it for them too. Yeah. Uh, how does this add value to the organization? So 
And sometimes people aren't smart enough to put connect the dots. And so gently, I think we need to, to say and what this means for you or what, and this is how I can add value, uh, you know, in that department or in the customer service area, to your point. And you guys are talking about the why. I'm always curious, Sarah, let me ask you this, the, the why. Why, what motivated you to do what you do? Where did that come from? And where's that fire coming from? Well, for years, I was all about customer service and customer experience. I was doing workshops um, around those topics internally with the organizations I was working for. And then as a, a side hustle, I was doing that with other organizations. And I thought that was where I was going to go with my lifetime career. Although as somebody with adaptability and activator and my top strengths and Gallup Strengths Finder, there is no long-term solution for me. It's always going to be trying new things and, and switching directions. But at the time, this is probably about 10 years ago, that's where I thought I was going to be. And about five or six years ago, I got a call from a woman from the ITMI, International Tour Management Institute. She had read an article I wrote on LinkedIn and asked me to submit a proposal to do a keynote for their annual symposium the next year. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to submit a proposal. What topic do you want me to talk about? And she, I said, customer service. She said, no, storytelling. And I hesitated just for a moment and said, sure, I can do that. And um, it, was, it was great. I had a wonderful time. They flew me out to Ontario, California, which is next to LA. And the best compliment I got after that keynote was when a gentleman who is clearly more of a, more cynical about that kind of thing and not particularly warm and fuzzy, he said, well, I just loved your presentation. I, I love stuff about storytelling. He said, I've never experienced one so practical. And I was really happy to hear that because I'm a practical person. And that started me thinking, Randy, that's really what got me started was there is a very practical and strategic side to storytelling that I think people forget. They, they feel like it's all about emotion and action. And a lot of people only feel like they have stories if they're epic stories. If they want to share the stories of nearly dying or some epic story of meeting this great celebrity or they don't realize that it's those pivotal moments, those one-time conversations you have with your parent or the one-time experience of um, meeting a stranger on a plane that just made something shift in the way that your brain works. Those are the stories that when we share them well, inspire and, and they connect us to the people in front of us in a way that nothing else can. Uh, one of the things that we talk about storytelling, and, and I'm old enough, and I know you're not, but Teddy, I think, uh, well, I know you are, Teddy, uh, old enough to remember this. <laughs> Terry, you're not old enough to remember this, but uh, all in the family. Remember all in the family and Archie and Edith and Meathead and all of that, right? My well, grandfather watched those shows. In black and white uh, on a little screen like that, right? <laughs> yeah. All huddled around. I watched the, the replays of them. They, they showed it on Nickelodeon, I think, or something. <laughs> it's funny. I, 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 I refer back to things from childhood, and half the time now you just get this blank stare. And they're like, really? I know. I do that with Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so one of the things when, when I coach our center's job hunting clients is – it, it, when it comes to storytelling or give an example of an accomplishment, sometimes the story goes on and on and on, hence the Edith Bunker mention. Yeah, Remember, Edith would talk forever. And if you're not going to be interrupted necessarily, the tendency is to vomit words during the interview for a variety of reasons because you hope to impress so you're them. Nervous. So, hmm? And you're nervous. Well, yeah, you're nervous, you want to impress, so bleh, it just puked everything that I know. And so now I've talked myself out of the job. So how can we help job hunters to condense or to modify their storytelling so that it, it, it is compelling, but they can get in and out without talking too long? As I mentioned, practice is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And the other part of that is identifying which three themes you want to come across in that story or two themes, depending on how long you can tell this story. Um, 
for instance, if I wanted to tell somebody I was a great cook, I'm not going to say, I'm a great cook. Instead, I'm going to tell you a story about the um, wood burning pizza oven we installed in our backyard. And over the course of about four months, I perfected the crust. We have this perfect Tuscan pizza crust that comes out of that oven now. And it bubbles up on the sides. And my favorite topping lately is to do brown butter. So you, you cook down butter until it turns brown and kind of caramelizes and added just a little chopped bit of sage from our garden. Put that on top of the pizza, add little chunks of chev, goat cheese and some capers and just stick it in that pizza oven and the crust comes up all bubbled. And it's just, when you break into it, it's elasticy and crunchy on the outside. And so is everybody drooling now? You hungry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta take a break here. I, I think my, uh, my pepperoni pizza's in the oven, but I'm not sure I'm gonna eat that now. So, but what you did though is you, you, when you just spoke, you appealed to my senses, my sense of taste, smell, visual, texture, all of those things versus saying, hey, I'm a great cook, I can fix anything, and I fixed it for the governor, right. you know, which is what most people would say, but you made it real. You, you, you incorporated our senses, I think, and that's something that uh, maybe people don't really consider when they tell their stories. Well, I think that's a big part of it. Um, you really want to describe it in a way that somebody feels like they're right there with you. Yeah. And the way that you can tell if you've gone off the mark is observing your audience. Again, I keep coming back to that as the biggest mistake people make is not watching. So in the book, I actually mention a time where I'm talking to one of my nieces, she's like 10 years old, and I'm trying to tell her this story. And it's really, to me, it's an important story. And my brother is watching this, and he's watching her slowly take steps backward away from me, which is really not a good sign. And I'm digging in because I really want to get this point across. And he finally looked at me, pulled me aside. He said, Sarah, land the plane. <laughs> and that, was, that was a huge important moment for me because I realized in that moment that not only had I lost her, but I wasn't going to get her back the more I dug in. So the important lesson there for somebody who has a tendency to go on and on is to, first of all, if you have a partner, a spouse, or a kid that you trust to give you a cue when you're going on too long, set up a cue ahead of time so that you can start practicing around that and having somebody that's there who is gentle and kind who can tell you, Sarah, land the plane. Land the plane. Land how, the plane. How do you do that during an interview when you don't have that friendly person there and now you're across the table from somebody going back to the Edith Bunker thing how do we do you have do you have tips or cues mm -hmm. that you look to during the interview to say hey I'd better wrap this thing up sure first things first if you see somebody lean back and cross their arms in front of their chest they're shut down they're not listening to you anymore either you said something that was insulting or they're annoyed or you've you've gone on too long and they're just dis they're distancing themselves um, you can tell when somebody is looking at you and smiling and encouraging you or if their face shifts and that you see their expression change. And it's a little intimidating and a little um, nerve wracking when you see that shift and it, sometimes it'll distract you from your story. Cut your losses. You can say, I know the story went on a little long, but the point is that when I did this, it turned out very successfully and this is why. Wrap it up. Don't try to dig yourself out of the story. Just wrap it up. Yeah. And I actually do that, like if I'm at a grocery store and I notice I'm talking too long to somebody who's trying to get somewhere and I notice their feet start to turn this way instead of this way um, and they're trying not to be rude or they're in a hurry, they really do want to hear the story, they love me, but they're just in a hurry then I'll say, oh my gosh, I've gone on too long. Let's get together for coffee so I can hear what's going on with you. Hey, hey folks, we're halfway through. It's 1230. And if, um, again, if, if you have questions that you'd like to ask of Sarah Elkins, uh, please do that in the chat box. But uh, Sarah joins us all the way from Montana. And what time is it out there? It's 1230 Eastern time. Are you two hours different? Or are you three? Yep, 1030. We're in the same time zone as Denver. Ah, I got you. Take it away, Teddy, what you got? Yeah. So, uh, Sarah, 
Uh, really good thoughts here, really good stuff to consider. Here's another thing that you shared that really got me thinking, and that is, how do I, how do I use my stories, maybe tell myself my stories to impact the way I think of myself and guide me in my future? I love that you asked that question because I think a lot of people don't realize how much those stories impact our internal messages. If you are telling a story about a boss who was abusive to you and all you're doing is complaining about how abusive it was, you're not learning the lessons you need to learn in order to build yourself up. You're, you're telling the story as a victim. So it's really important that when you think about those things that happened in your life, they happen to you, turn it around and think about how it happened for you. What lessons did you learn from it? What experiences did you gain where you were able to apply what you learned from that previous experience to improve the next one? Yeah. Those, that's how you shift your stories. Yeah, real good. What's the uh, saying? You know, people call it say you're you either win or you lose. And those of us who are trying to be more positive about our life stories say that we are either win or we learn. learn. Mm -hmm. We do have a question. We have a question from Suzanne who says, what if you're on a phone interview and you're not able to see their expressions like this or whatever? What happens when you're on the phone? That's a great question. I actually find phone interviews to be a little bit easier because you can have, you can actually practice a story and not worry about, um, going on too long because you'll have your story kind of the key points written out in front of you that you can be looking at. So I highly recommend that as they're asking the question, most of the time they give you the questions ahead of time, um, at least a few minutes ahead of time. As you're looking at the question, jot down your, your story that you're going to use and the main point you want to make. And then if you have a moment to think about it, think about how you're going to end it. So one of the things I always do when I'm doing a workshop or public speaking is I have one line that I've practiced over and over again that ends my presentation. So um, think about how you would end the answer to that question. What's the last thing you want to say so that it'll ring in their memory as that's the thing that they remember the most? Yeah, good. Is that helpful? Hopefully that answered Suzanne's question. Yeah. yeah, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. And again, we read body language, but when you're on the phone, all you have is tone of voice and the words, not the body language piece. So very important to be astute uh, all around. So yeah, good question. And again, if you have other questions, go ahead and chat them in there. We'll see if we can get them, uh, get them answered. So, so, so we're, we're telling our stories. We're, we're practicing it doing this well. How do we look at, let me see if I can say this the right way. How do we look at um, our behaviors and the, and, the, and the story and make sure, you know, the words that we use in our story and make sure they align with not only our values and strengths, but in, uh, make sure they align around us without being a fraud, but make sure they also align with the person that we're talking to for them in regards to the role. Does that make sense? I stretch that. Sure. Well, it, it really comes down to doing your research ahead of time. If you're in an interview, you better have Googled the heck out of that company. Yeah. I mean, you need to know and look on LinkedIn, find if you have any connections in common that are employed at that company, find out what they seem to value the most because many times it's not what's in their mission statement yeah. Yeah. and um, know whether it's going to even be a good fit for you. Do that research ahead of time. Um, and there's an exercise in the book about understanding your own values and being able to demonstrate those through your stories. So again, if you want to be known as generous or compassionate or considerate to the people around you, you can tell a story that demonstrates that whether it's a work related or personal story, it doesn't matter. They want to know your character. And um, make sure that you are in alignment, that you're telling a story that really demonstrates the um, characteristics that you want people to know about you. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, I tell a story about how when I'm on the mountain behind my house and I see 
Some people, you know, they pick up after their dog, but they leave the bag next to the trail to pick up later so that they don't have to carry it all the way up the mountain and all the way back down. And I, a few summers ago, I was with a friend and we were hiking back down the mountain and I saw three of them and I picked up every one of them and put them in the trash at the end of the hike. She said, why do you do that? And I said, well, first of all, I'm the dog poop fairy. I just pick it up. And she started laughing. I said, there really is a dog poop fairy. I'm the one, I'm, I'm it. But I said, here's the thing. I am a pet owner and I love my dog. And I, I do not want to give non-pet owners, non-dog owners, any ammunition for not liking us or trusting us or considering us to be considerate people. I want to be a good ambassador for other dog owners. So I pick it up. Yeah. Chocolate Labs. Chocolate Lab. That's that's my baby. He's a gigantic chocolate lab. <laughs> what's uh, what's your dog's name again? Toby. It's Toby. short for Toby. It's short for Toblerone. Yes, Toblerone. That's what I saw. Yeah. So I we did my research, Sarah. <laughs> Randy. <laughs> Yeah, we have a, a follow-up uh, by Steve. She is asking, does Sarah have any good body language book recommendations? And if you do, maybe mention them, and then uh, we can put it in the show notes, and, and we'll have those. Sure. But if you, if you can think of any off the top of your head, that'd be great. If you need to get back later, then, uh, then do so. Don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, no. I do. I do. Right off the top of my head, I do a lot of research for my topic, mm -hmm. and um, and I use a lot of other people's books as references. One of them is Talk Like Ted by Carmine Gallo. Mm -hmm. It's a great book. He talks mostly about um, the timing, tone, and body language of, of speaking, particularly by researching TED Talks, TED speakers um, for a decade or something like that. So Carmine Gallo, Talk Like Ted. Another one would be, um, there are a couple books by Mark Bowden, B-O-W-D-E-N. He's up in Toronto and his TED is actually mentioned. He's, he spoke at TEDx Toronto many years ago and he, his book is mentioned in my book. I actually took a big chunk of his TED talk and added it into the book and he did a blurb for it um, after he read the book. His books are just outstanding and his TED talk, I highly, highly recommend. It's the importance of being inauthentic. Mm -hmm. And I'll offer, uh, Randy, uh, yep. before you go to James, I'll offer that there are three people that I, I truly respect in the space of the body language experts. First is a lady named Blanca Cobb, B-L-A-N-C-A-C-O-B-B, -B, Blanca Cobb. The second one is a lady named Lisa Mitchell. And the third is a lady by the name of Nikki Thornton. And don't ask me, I don't know the answer to why there's no men on that list. <laughs> All right, a uh, couple questions here in the chat box. Somebody would be interested, uh, Matt would be interested in hearing more about how to reframe stories so that it's not what happened to you, but how it happened for you. I love that question. Well, let me give you an example. Um, I had a job with a boss who was really abusive. She was, she was cruel to me to the point where if I repeated some of what she said to me, it would curl your toes. You'd be shocked that somebody would say this in a professional environment. And um, she had scheduled a half year evaluation, which was only because she wanted to say mean things, right? She had all these, the laundry list of things that I had done wrong that she wanted to point out to me. And at the last minute, she invited her boss to join us in this meeting. And I remember being surprised and asking her, well, why, why did you invite Chris to join us? She said, I can invite whoever I want. So there was no explanation. And I thought, oh, great. She manages, she micromanages in the same way that my boss micromanages. And so I'm going to be assaulted is what I, I was envisioning. So I took a little walk outside the building about 15 minutes before the meeting and I'm shaking. Like I am near tears. I know this is going to be awful. And I called my friend, her name is Marcia Polis. And she um, is just this brilliant Pilates instructor and just, just brilliant body mechanics person. She said, Sarah, first of all, she gave me some calming down breathing exercises. She said, you have to be calm when you're in there. And I'm not a particularly emotional person. And she could, she could tell that I was really upset. She said, you know what? 
pretend there's a video camera recording this conversation in the room. Pretend that it's recording all the nuance, all of what's going on, all the words, and that you're gonna have to watch this in a year or five years or 10 years down the line. How do you want to remember this interaction? It was brilliant. It was the most brilliant strategy I had ever heard. And I didn't know it at the time. It's years later, I've been doing this with coaching clients for oh, five years now. Um, but I remember I, I sat down in that room and every time, it was literally a laundry list of all the things I had done wrong and they were all very personal. None of it had anything to do with my job as a compliance officer. Um, and she would say something and I remember I'd feel my hackles start to go up and I'd lean back and I'd give this Mona Lisa smile, just go, <laughs> hmm. And I would think for a second and pause, which is the key to anything that's happening to you is to pause and so that you can figure out how it's happening for you instead. And you, and I would lean back and I would say, hmm, I could see why that was a misunderstanding. This is how I saw that situation. And I was able to reframe everything that was happening in that moment to be a lesson. And now I can look back at all of the different stories that I experienced and think of it in terms of what was the lesson that I learned from it. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but reframing is really about understanding the context of the story. And actually another example would be, I had a coaching client that was saying that um, her mother told her she wasn't very bright. And so from this point forward, this is a 50 year old woman, from, this, from the point at 10 years old when her mother said that, she is constantly trying to prove that she's bright. So 40 years later, she's still constantly trying to prove that she's bright. And the way we were able to reframe it together was to go back so that she was observing what happened at 10 years old. I said, well, where were you sitting? What had happened right before this conversation? What did it look like in the room? Do you remember who else was in the room? What exactly did your mother say to you? Was that in the context of a math quiz or something that you didn't do well on? What were your other grades at the time? What were you good at at the time? And slowly but surely, we were able to create this image and a complete visual of what had happened at that moment. So I said, what was your mother like? What was she wearing? Was she happy in her life at that moment? And all of a sudden, I could see this release of this woman's shoulders. She said, no, she was miserable. Her sister had gone to college and she hadn't gone to college because she had kids and she knew there was more for her, but she, she was just kind of stuck. And I said, do you think maybe she was projecting her discomfort and insecurities on her daughter because she was trying to protect you? She was trying to help you not get your hopes up that you would be doing something more interesting than what she is doing. Yeah. Is that maybe, and within 24 hours, after I asked her to retell the story to two different people that weren't her family members, she was able to retell the story with the context of where her mother was at that time, and it changed everything. Yeah, Sarah, I have a... Um... Um, a story that I share, and I won't share the whole story here, but when I shared the story, and this is relevant to being a job seeker, um, you know, I meet with a, a hiring manager at, um, you know, local community college, and he looked at my resume and said, I can't hire you. You don't even have the word training on your resume. Now, this guy, it was a foregone conclusion that I was going to do this work, but he just wanted to make sure that I understood that his processes were his processes and that included reviewing my resume. Uh, he, he basically said to me in a very polite way, the guy's name is Ron Randy and you know who he is. And he said to me very clearly, he said, go rewrite your resume and then come back. Now I stormed out there because I, you know, I was pompous idiot back then thinking that, you know, this is ridiculous. But I got in my car, I called my wife. My wife says, think about why he said that to you. 
And, um, you know, I'm, I'm develop, I'm a developing career coach and I'm looking for a job. And my resume doesn't even have the word training in it. I look for a training job and it doesn't have the word training in it. Dummy. <laughs> so, well, you know, I love that Teddy, because, um, having that intention, knowing what the intention was behind what they said to you yeah. is huge. Yeah. It's huge. Did, did they intend to insult you? If no, it's a yes. no, it wasn't. It, he was not insulted. This guy right. never insulted, but he was very deliberate. And he said, you, mm-hmm. you we got to follow my process. And my process says no training. I can't hire you as a training trainer. And yeah, it, it's understanding, it, understanding the why, the why, yeah. why you asked. Now, yeah. why is a challenging question. And so words like help me understand or something like that to kind of soften it. And Sarah, mm-hmm. something you mentioned earlier, I, I coach clients talking about uh, verbal cushions and when you talked about something I could see where that led to miscommunication or that that's a verbal cushion. It allows people to drop their defenses a little bit, allows you to tell your story without coming across as confrontational. Yeah. What's it to you? Why do you ask? You know, that's, that's in your face. So you did an excellent job of illustrating how to buy some time and help people drop their defenses and be more open and receptive now to hearing what you have to say versus just waiting to hammer you with something else. Well, I think it's important that when you are addressing that kind of behavior, that you aren't insulting the person, but you're yeah. calling them on the bad behavior. Those are two completely different things. The dad of four da- daughters, I know this now that they're <laughs> fully grown. <laughs> yeah, it takes that, doesn't it, unfortunately? Yeah, yeah. So, Sarah, this is great. I really appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot more that we could talk about. Would you do us a huge favor and wrap up this in, you know, if you could in a statement to the group about the you know the power of their stories in uh, as a job seeker could you sure remember as you're talking about your history that it's not the things that happen to you that you'll be defined by it's the way you responded to those things that happened so when you tell a story talk about how you responded to something as opposed to what happened to you I always recommend, especially in a situation where you are um, really trying to get the point across about who you are, if you're going to talk about your struggle and then your success following a struggle, which is always the best way to get people to connect with you, you start with like maybe 10% of your story, maybe 15% of your story is about the struggle itself. The other 80% has to be about how you handled it. It has to be the positive result of it. And this is not rose colored glasses. This is not pretending like something bad didn't happen. It's really about how we responded to something that happened in our lives and what we gained from it. Because no matter what it is, whether it's intense grief of the loss of a loved one or a diagnosis or a breakup or even um, you know, a job that didn't work out the way we intended, The most important aspect of that story has to be how we became resilient as a result of it, not the suffering itself. Good. By the way, the rest of the story of my resume. So I went home and I started thinking about it and I started understanding where it was coming from. So what it did for me is what you're teaching me, Sarah, through your podcast and through your book and even this conversation is how did that engagement make me better? Exactly. So I, so I rewrote my resume and I understood the value of it. And today I understand the value of making sure everything I share relevant to my goal, either in a story or written form is relevant to the goal. I walk back into that office um, off of Silas Creek Parkway, buddy, of Point of Randy. And uh, I walk back in his office and I said to him, before we talk, I just want to thank you. So that's a pivotal moment. That's in your story portfolio, Teddy. It is. That it is. story, that interaction is part of your story portfolio. Yeah. yeah so, um, and by the way, um, uh, we just got uh, the thought thrown at us for a repeat guest. Um, maybe one day we'll invite you to come back and talk about Strength Finder. Oh, I would love that. It's a wonderful tool. Yeah. I've never been into assessments, but man, this one, it really is applied, yeah. practical. 
Absolutely. And it's actually my colleague, Susan, that uh, posed that. She is a huge, huge fan of that. And I, I shared with her that you were going to be our guest today. And, and so uh, she was sure to, to tune in. So very good. Yeah, we'd love to have you come back. And that, that, would, be, that, would, that would be awesome. Uh, storytelling, and, and I think back to, uh, without to get too overtly political here, because uh, we are in that season, but I, I think back to debates and when politicians are notorious for this, I guess, and I'll, I'll say in a good way, but they tell a story versus saying, hey, I'm great, I'm great. They'll say, let me tell you a story about the time I met Sarah. Here's what she was doing. And people can relate to stories because they've had their own stories versus somebody just blowing their own horn about how great they are. So I, again, it, I think it hits on the emotion side and some of the sensory perceptions that we have again sight sound smell taste that kind of thing so we can relate to you because part of the hiring process is not just do you have the hard skills to do the work it's culture fit and do i feel like you fit in here do i like you and trust you and i think storytelling is is pivotal to help bridge that gap or to help kind of tie things together to say you know what i can do the job but I, i'll also work really well with this group here yeah i like it and i really appreciate you coming in yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, um, I, Sarah, I, I, I echo, really, I echo my buddy. I absolutely, thank you for coming in. Thank you for the stories and the conversations. Uh, by the way, Randy, you touched on that. You hit the, you used the word politics. So guess what? Next week, next week, uh, our special guest. I did that guest, on purpose. On purpose, of course. You're good, buddy. Uh, our special guest is, uh, again, a personal friend of Randy's and I. Man, Randy, we, you and I know some cool people. How yeah, did that Sarah, happen? I saw her this morning. Uh, she serves on the same uh, board uh, that I do with, with an organization, but Leslie Spees will join us. And she'll be in to talk about faith, politics, those hot topic. During job search. They're in the nerd, yeah, in a, in a job search, also when you're employed. Too. How do you bridge that or approach or dodge or whatever, uh, faith, politics, and some other hot button issues. So. There's She's no with, danger there. There's no danger at all. Nah, so, nah yeah. not at all. So, so again, some landmines ahead that, that could come into play. So uh, we've got a few minutes left. Usually what we do, Sarah, if you could stick around, uh, but Teddy and I usually will just share some, some thoughts, uh, partly based on what we talked about today and any anecdotal things, anything you got going on, Teddy, anything you want to You know, I, it, uh, by the way, I've got to hit enter on this. So I'll share it with the group. Yeah. Uh, I got to hit the enter key, Randy. I did it. Um, you know, uh, yeah, stories. I, 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 I love stories. I love impactful stories. I wish I was good at it. Uh, I've gotten better. Um, I've got three, po three uh, blog, blogs that I run. One of them is tlburris.com, which is nothing more than stories about Teddy. Um, peeling back all the layers. Sarah, you, you, um, to, you, you, I don't say this bluntly beyond being real, but I contend that when I die, there will be no untold story of Teddy that should be told that wasn't told. Did there I say that safely? That should be told. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and so I'm I getting what you're picking up there, what you're dropping <laughs> off there. Yeah, I'm getting it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to tell you about going to the George in Vail, Colorado three times. But anyway, uh, I think it's important that you find ways to share your stories, not only for possibly the enjoyment or encouragement of others, but just so you can get your stories out in front of your own eyes. Because when you look at your own stories, it really does help you get a better visual, a better understanding of who you, who you are yourself. So think about it's really, mm -hmm. Good, it's so. really the only way to, to see the patterns in your life and choose what you want to do with them. It's not a matter of choosing or deciding that every pattern is a bad pattern. It's just a, a matter of being self-reflective enough and seeing the patterns and then choosing. So one of the things that I, I get really pretty intense about when I'm doing any kind of keynotes or workshops on personal brand is I say, you know, if you are totally satisfied with your life and your relationships, maybe you don't need to do a lot of work. But if there's any aspect of your life that you're dissatisfied with, you need to look at those stories, find the patterns, and figure out where you're getting in your own way. Yeah, yeah. huge. Getting in my own way. 
-hmm. Usually that's some of our biggest problems. I speak for myself. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. So that's been my experience. Of, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of get get your stories out there and don't let them linger in the in the background of your your feeble mm -hmm. little mind, Teddy. Randy, you have a thought? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, there's a, uh, Sarah, you may, may be familiar with him, I don't know, but Nito Cobain is a very well-known uh, speaker, keynote speaker. He happens to be president of High Point University here. Uh, a renowned business success story came over from Lebanon with, you know, the old uh, 10 cents in his pocket kind of thing, and now he's a multimillionaire, and, and he has inspired so many people. I bring his name up because I, I was at an event of his, and I've, I've had a chance to, to meet him several times privately or in small groups and chat with him. And he's a, he's a fantastic speaker. And he says, Randy, you know what? He said, what I do for a lot of these talks, I have these five minute little vignettes. And it's almost like an inner, it's almost like with a resume, if they need customer service, they need, you know, administrative, they need sales, then you know what? He takes out those little components and has the little five minute vignettes and their stories, again, storytelling. And that's part of what his allure is, is that this guy's different every time and he can interchange the parts. It's a bit like a stand up comedian, really, when you get into it, hey, I've got my shtick about how, you know, this is funny or that's funny. And they just wheel that out. But I, just to kind of wrap things up, at least on this end, real quick, life's a journey. And I say that a lot. We've all had a lot of chapters, uh, not always good chapters, but you know what? We learn from them. And I think one of the things I learned from you today, Sarah, is to be more purposeful and meaningful and to write them down. I think too often in life, I know I'm guilty of it because I feel like I can just get up and wing it and, and nine times out of 10, that's okay. But I think if I am more purposeful with writing down the topics and the story and a couple key bullet points, I think I could do a better job if I'm in that interview or just frankly, just telling a story to somebody because now I'm consciously aware of what I want to say versus just winging it and hope that it goes okay. So again, thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate you joining us this morning all the way from Montana. So awesome. My pleasure, Teddy? thanks. Yeah, got a couple minutes left. Anything else you guys need to, to toss in there? Sarah, does the ferret have a name? <laughs> oh, Rocky, well, is it right? I'm I'm just going to back this up a little bit. I didn't name the ferret. We adopted him from one of my son's friends who couldn't keep him anymore. His name is Bandit. I would have named him something a little more original, but <laughs> he's uh, he's very sweet and uh, surprisingly surprisingly fun to hang out with. And what's really entertaining is watching my gigantic 110 pound chocolate lab play with the ferret. Yeah. Um, that ferret has no fear. It's really pretty impressive. So, <laughs> bandit. So, again, Sarah, thank you for joining us. I appreciate thank it. You. Buddy, good seeing you today. Everybody, it's uh, every Wednesday at noon, Eastern Standard Time. If you know someone that would benefit from the stories that our special guests share with us, uh, please invite them. We have a little bit more room because today we we almost hit the 30,000 mark uh, at, 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 the, at the end of the show. You know, it's yep. uh, pretty cool to have that many at the end of the show. So again, everybody have a great week and we'll see you another day. See you next time. Thank you, Sarah. Bye.